All right, Bulldogs, we're about to jump into IP security here with both feet, believe me. And I want to give you just about a minute uh, here, uh, a little word of advice for you as far as IP security goes. There, there's a lot of theory here in the next couple of videos, and it's probably theory or likely theory that you haven't seen yet. We're going to be passing some values around, some parameters, some things have to match, some things don't. Uh, so in some ways, it's going to be like old home week, right? It's going to be like learning OSPF or EIGRP for the first time. You've got to learn all these values, and you get a little overwhelmed by it. But the thing is, you hang in there, and you master it. What I want to mention to you is just about everything you see here in the theory part that we're going to go through first, you're going to see in labs as well. We're going to configure it with Cisco Configuration Professional. Uh, we'll also do a little bit of work likely from the command line. I just want you to get a little bit of a feel for that. And once you work with site-to-site -site VPNs and that kind of thing uh, at the command line, you'll be really happy to have Cisco Configuration <laughs> Professional around. Uh, it can get a little lengthy at the command line, I certainly admit. But what I just want to tell you here is, if it gets a little overwhelming for you the first time you look at it, that's okay, because there's a lot going on. But you will see all of this again in, uh, in the video in the labs and that's why I like a course like this. You know, in-person training is fine, but you only get to see it once. And it's really that second, third, and even fourth time uh, when you see something that it really starts clicking with you. So having said that, let's jump right in and talk about IPsec, what it does, and start talking about the operation of it. IPsec, it's just short for IP security, and it allows us to authenticate and or encrypt every IP packet in a particular data stream. What we're going to be able to do is identify streams of traffic that should be encrypted, should be protected with IP security, and if we don't indicate it, then it'll just be sent you know, in regular format. It's not going to be sent via IP security. We will have much more of that to come. Just a couple of fun IPsec facts here. Uh, it runs at layer 3 of the OSI model, where SSL and SSH run from layers 4 through 7. Uh, applications do not need to be specifically designed to utilize IPsec. And what IPsec is going to do, among other things, is use checksums and hashing algorithms such as MD5, certainly familiar to us by this point, uh, and SSA1 to assure data integrity. We'll see those choices in labs as well. Now, the members of the Open Standard IPsec suite, and there is some fertile ground for exam questions here. Let's be realistic because we've got a couple of a uh, couple of things here and there are some differences between them so let's take a look at those differences the authentication header AH that defines a method for authentication and securing data the encapsulating security payload ESP you knew I'd say that which defines a method for authenticating securing and encrypting data and security I should say now the IKE, the Internet Key Exchange, we've been talking about that a bit. That negotiates the security parameters and the authentication keys, and we're going to see that in the IKE process as well. Uh, here is the IPsec packet format, and as you can see, it is not here. So let me bring it up. I know a couple of these drawings will be a little smaller, so let me bring that up. And notice that when we've got AH, you know, we, we've got a header, but we don't have a trailer. With ESP, you know, we've got that header and trailer around the data, which is encapsulation. And that is a good thing to remember about our friend ESP. I mentioned that not to be a smart aleck, but just to say that sometimes we forget these acronyms actually stand for something. You know, what? well, which one of these encapsulate? It's ESP. Well, AH, let's hit that one first. Authentication header. And it's defined in RFC 2402, and it offers solid securities. Nothing wrong with AH. Now it provides data origin authentication as well as offering optional anti-replay protection. And we know we can also just call that replay protection. Now the drawback with authentication header is that the authentication it provides for the IP header is not complete. And that's because some of the IP fields can't be correctly predicted by the receiver. These are mutable fields, and of course anything that's mutable uh, can be changed, and these mutable fields can change during transmission. Now, AH will successfully protect the payload. You know, that's really what we're interested in. So again, AH offers solid security. It's a good idea to know, though, what it offers and what it does not. Again, it offers data origin authentication, data integrity, and optional anti-replay protection. It does not offer 
data confidentiality. See, now you know why I was being so picky about these terms uh, much earlier in the course. Now, the Encapsulating Security Payload, ESP, it does exactly what the name says. As we saw a moment ago with ESP, we've got a header and we've got a trailer, and that means we have encapsulation. It offers all of the following, data origin authentication, anti-replay protection, and data confidentiality. So we see one major difference there. Now, we're already starting to get into uh, a, a variation of an argument or a question that we had early, early, early in our CCNA studies, actually our CSENT studies, if you took the two exam path. You know, remember the question, hey, if TCP is so great, you know, if it has all these features, then why use UDP at all? Remember that? Of course, the answer was overhead. TCP's overhead was a lot higher. Well, in this case, the question is, if ESP is so great, especially when it offers data confidentiality, then why would we use AH at all? Well, what do you think? It's related to that. There, uh, one of the things, one of the factors is related to that discussion we had about TCP and UDP. It's really overhead. ESP is a lot more processor intensive than AH. You know, one of the things I, I like to say is don't, don't pay for something you don't need. And if you don't need the data confidentiality, why pay for it in the form of a processor head? You know, why do that? Now, ESP also requires strong cryptography, and not only is that not always available, it's not always legal. If you look carefully at uh, the boot process, when you first boot a Cisco router, if you've got one in the lab, you can reload. Just watch that. There's usually a warning in there, especially if you have some of these features. Uh, you know, that you can't use it in certain countries, in certain regions of the world. So it's just uh, something to be aware of there. Now let's talk about the case of Tunnel V Transport, because I'm sure this is going to come up on your test in one way or another. And these are a couple of modes that we can run both ESP and AHN. Now in Tunnel Mode, the entire IPsec process totally transparent to the end devices. They don't even know what's going on. And we have specialized IPsec gateway devices to handle the entire IPsec workload. Now the entire IP packet is encrypted in tunnel mode and then that encrypted packet is placed into another IP packet. So the encapsulating packet will have the IP addresses configured on the tunnel endpoints and it's those tunnel IP addresses that will be used to route the packet. It's pretty cool stuff because you'll actually see a tunnel, say interface tunnel zero and have an IP address on it as well. You'll need that. Now transport mode encrypts the IP payload but the IPsec header is inserted directly after the IP header in the packet. So as a result with transport mode there's no protection for the original IP address the original IP address will be used for routing, and only data from the transport layer up is protected by IPsec. Now, I know you can replay the videos, but let's go over that again while we're here. Again, in tunnel mode, the keys are the entire process is transparent to the end hosts, and you have specialized gateway devices. With tunnel mode, the entire packet is encrypted, and then that encrypted packet is placed into another IP packet, and the encapsulating packet will have the IP addresses configured on the tunnel endpoints, uh, and it's those tunnel IP addresses that will be used to route the packet, so you truly are tunneling it. With transport mode, the payload is encrypted, but the IPsec header is inserted directly after the IP header in the packet, so there's no protection for the original IP address, it's just hanging out there. The original IP address will be used to routing, obviously, and only data from the transport layer up is protected now, before we get into more details, I should say, of how IPsec works, let's look at IKE a bit, the Internet Key Exchange. It's defined in RFC 2409, and what IKE is going to have to do is negotiate the parameters of the communications channel, authenticate both endpoints, handle the exchange of public keys, and manage the keys. That's a lot of work. And we actually need three protocols to get all this done. Now, IKE is actually a combination of Scheme, S-K-E-M-E, -E, enabling public key encryption for authentication. ISAKEMP, I-S-A-K-M-P, defines how messages will be exchanged. And then Oakley defines the mechanism for the key exchanges. Now, here's one of those little bizarre things that pops up in networking from time to time. 
IKE is a two-phase process, and there are three phases we need to know about. There's a phase in the middle, it's optional. I want you to know about it, but it's not gonna come into play during our labs. Now, phase one, two IPsec enabled devices have to come to an agreement on what methods are going to be used to exchange data over a secure communications channel. Now we're going to have options there, and I mentioned typically uh, we're going to use PSK, a pre-shared key for that purpose. We could also use our new friend digital certificates. That's going to be one of our options. Now this can be done, uh, phase one, in either main or aggressive mode. Now aggressive is a little faster as you'd expect but none of the information exchanged in aggressive mode is encrypted. You're not crazy about that. And we'll take an illustrated look at both of those modes here shortly. Now this phase results in creating a security association. We're going to have two SAs here, so we want to watch this. This phase results in creating an SA for the ISACEMP process itself. It's an IKE SA. A security association is simply a contract between two hosts as to the IPsec parameters that are going to be used for communications between the two. Now in contrast to most essays that you're going to run into in your studies present and future, an IKE is, uh, essay is bi-directional. So we only need one security association here for two IPsec peers to communicate. Now this particular essay negotiates the following, and quite a few, quite a bit of this looks familiar to us now. The hash algorithm, whether that's going to be MD5 or SHA, uh, the authentication method itself, the encryption algorithm to be used, and the Diffie-Hellman group to be used. We are going to have a choice of group numbers there. Now phase 1.5, here's that odd phase I told you about, it's kind of in the middle of things. It's an optional phase and it can use extended authentication or XAuth for additional security. That one might pop up on your exam, but one and two definitely are. Now, phase two, the SA that was previously mentioned is now going to be used in phase two, and this is where the IPsec peers have to agree on the attributes to be used to create the security associations for AH and ESP. So this is a security association, but it has a slightly different purpose. This one is used to create the SA for AH and ESP. Watch this one because the security associations created in this phase are unidirectional. So a lot going on there with SAs. And here we're starting to get to configuring a site-to-site -site VPN. And that's what we're going to discuss first and then we'll actually do it in a lab. The first step is process initialization via interesting traffic. What makes traffic interesting? We will talk about that very shortly. Then we've got our two IKE phases. The first one is IKE phase one, which is the IKE essay negotiation, and then IKE phase two, and that's the IPsec essay negotiation. Finally, not quite finally, but at last, I should say, we have the data transfer, and then we have the tunnel termination. Because when we're done, there's really, we don't want to just leave that tunnel in place because there's overhead to everything we do. We're not going to leave that in place. Now, IPsec does not start working by itself, and, and that's good. We don't want everything you know, protected by IPsec because that would be a lot of overhead. We're going to use something called a crypto access list to define interesting traffic, and it's that interesting traffic that initializes the entire IPsec process. Now, don't let the term crypto access list intimidate you. I, I know that sounds, ooh, crypto, you know, do we have to write it in, you know, we have to write it in encrypted format? I mean, it sounds really, uh, really complicated. Uh, it's going to be like writing a regular access list. The use of it, of course, is going to be different. And there's one rule change you have to get used to um, that's a little different from the regular ACL. But again, don't let that term uh, intimidate you a bit. We are going to stop this video right now. We're headed for 15 minutes, and that's where I like to stop. When we come back, we're going to start going through the details of Phase 1. I'm going to introduce you to transform sets and where all this information is going before our site-to-site -site VPN is set up. So take a deep breath, get a cup of coffee or whatever you need, and I'll see you on the next video.